Hey guys, welcome to Book Review 119. Today I am going to be reviewing Rickshaw Beijing. Uh, let's get a better view of this. By David Strand. Uh, anyway, this book is a sociological look at China in the 1920s in the Republican era, um, and specifically the city of Beijing, and more specifically, um, kind of a look from the everyday lives of people in the city. You know, a lot of books like this would be written sort of in a didactic political approach, you know. Shanghai Shek, uh, some of the other warlords of the era, uh, sort of an emerging uh, Mao Zedong, an emerging communist movement. Well, those things are all taken into consideration, but it's more a look at uh, how larger political trends developed uh, through um, the city, uh, specifically on the citywide level, not on the level of China as a whole. Um, and kind of how those uh, uh, more subtle or uh, kind of minute changes uh, affected change and really spoke to how the city really functioned rather than uh, what outside dictates uh, said about the city. Uh, well, anyway, the book starts with kind of uh, how we got to this point, um, specifically the end of the uh, imper or imperial, the end of the empire of China, the end of the imperial era, um, with Pu Yi uh, and his death, and then the, or his, not his death, but his overthrow in, I believe it was 1912, um, and the beginning of the Republican era. Um, but what's specifically interesting about that is that the Republican era never really got off its feet in terms of what you might consider like a modern republic. Um, certainly they had the ideals to, but the power structure was weak enough that uh, fairly quickly the country uh, split into various warlording factions, um, specifically because the pin might speak uh, stronger than the sword in the long run, but when someone has specific power base, particularly in a country like China that's so kind of spread out, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, it's really hard to maintain a central power through a Republican means. Uh, there's that argument even made about China today. I'm not sure how true it is with modern technology uh, that, that, that couldn't exist. I think it might be able to exist, but it's still a very sort of diverse, large, unwieldy uh, country. Um, so then the uh, author, David Strantz, focuses sort of on uh, kind of how the rickshaw came about. Uh, this isn't really yet the, the rickshaw men in China, but it's about kind of uh, transportation in Beijing prior to uh, the Republican era. Uh, specifically, there wasn't much transportation needed because most people uh, operated in guilds, which tended to be true into the 1920s. Um, but there was sort of a, the beginning of change during that, uh, that time period that uh, uh, affected um, why people would need like uh, rickshaw drivers. Uh, the specifics of why a guild was important to transportation during this time period, during the, the uh, imperial time period, was that uh, most people worked, lived, operated, um, had most of their daily means uh, done within a radius of pretty much their house or a few kind of buildings that were very close together. Uh, the effect of this is later seen uh, in sort of larger... Uh, unionist movements that take place in Beijing and specifically the difficulty they have in this because of how integrated the city was in terms of um, business, housing, wealth, poor, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Whereas like newer cities like Shanghai, uh, they definitely had like their business district and then like the uh, larger sort of migrant worker class um, were much more uh, acceptable to unionism because there was very much that divide there. Um, okay, so we got the uh, rickshaw, the machine for a mixed up age. Uh, yeah, so uh, prior to uh, the Republican era, there were a lot of, uh, as I mentioned, people didn't move very much, but when they did move, uh, need transportation, I mean, within the city, uh, they would use like donkey carts or very slow means of transportation, walking, um, a lot of times they use those, uh, I can't remember what they call them, but uh, where you hire people and then they just carry you on their shoulders uh, with, you know, like four people and, well, uh, yeah, I forget what that's called. Uh, you know, like a imperial 
Cartman. I don't know. Uh, which I guess in, in a way is a form of a rickshaw, but the rickshaw with its uh, technology of the two wheels uh, was just much more modern. Um, so this brings us sort of to how the rickshaw developed. The rickshaw uh, was invented in Tokyo, and even though during this time period um, the Japanese and the Chinese were very much enemies, uh, the Chinese, specifically in Beijing, as well as other cities, uh, took on this technology as a way to improve their, their standard of living, specifically after the uh, imperial throne fell, in which case there was no more playing around the point that China needed to modernize. And as sort of uh, anti-modern as, or as sort of um, uh, inhumane at times that the rickshaw trade can be, could be, there was no doubt that it was a quicker means of transportation uh, for the elites of the city, or even like the upper tier of the city, uh, compared to the old method, which really, there was no sort of quick transportation. Um, okay, so then they talk a little bit, uh, yeah, then they talk a little bit about the rickshaw men themselves, um, kind of who they were, where they came from. And I always think of the rickshaw men sort of as like uh, your Wild West entrepreneurs. Um, they were often people that came in from outside the city. They were migrants as well. Um, but because uh, they maybe didn't form in as cohesive a uh, unit, if you will, as in Shanghai, where there were other units that were also kind of very uh there was a dichotomy between the owner and the uh, uh, rest. Uh, union, union, unionism uh, did not take as much effect in Beijing as it did in some of those other cities. This is specifically brought uh, to attention by the fact that um, rickshaw men, for the most part, did not own their own rickshaw. If you did own your own rickshaw, you were definitely considered the very upper tier of rickshaw men. And if you did own your own rickshaw, you would often be hired out to... Um, a very wealthy client uh, to be their personal rickshaw man, whereas the majority, the vast majority of rickshaw men rented their rickshaws, in which case they were just like taxi drivers in the modern day where they kind of picked up clients on the street depending on who that they could uh, get to. Um, so this being said, uh, even though th many of the rickshaw men were migrants, um, a lot of the garages were small-scale garages. So it's kind of, uh, if there's like three um, corporate garages, and I mean garages for the rickshaws, like places where you could rent the rickshaws, uh, in the city, it's very easy to uh, rebel against that. But when uh, even the uh, garages are having trouble operating because none of them are big enough because they're all small scale. That's something that you definitely take from this book is that while Beijing could operate on a large scale eventually, um, because there wasn't because it was an ancient city and there was a lot of uh, both infrastructure and just sort of social uh, history or social strata in place already, uh, it was very hard for things to operate sort of on a mass scale. It was very much sort of a city of artisans, a city of small businessmen, um, a city of kind of, uh, yeah, of small business. Uh, which kind of goes against the imperial uh, dictate. But the reason that came about, I think, is because um, there were a lot of people that were needed in the imperial era. And with a lot of people, there were a lot of sort of uh, uh, trades that were needed. And so while Beijing was a big city with all these small trades, uh, the smaller cities eventually became big fast, in which, like Shanghai, which facilitated, again, facilitated... Uh, kind of uh, more modern business practices by just uh, business of scale, if you will. Uh, let's see. And then you talked about the uh, rickshaw men, you know, as a uh, kind of, or not the rickshaw men, we just talked about the rickshaw men. You talked about the policemen. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting. The policemen and the rickshaw men were sort of like uh, modern day criminals and police uh, in the United States. Now, not exactly the same, but in the sense that, um, the policemen were way closer to the rickshaw men than an idealistic uh, or, or even just like what you would think of like law enforcement. You know, you often hear these stories in the United States of families where there wasn't a lot of economic opportunity. And one of the uh, 
brothers or whatever got into drugs or got into drug dealing and the other brother got into being in the police and it seems kind of like the flip side of the same coin um well that's it the uh dichotomy was true with police officers they were often sort of uh lower middle class uh and uh at the same economic strata as rickshaw men maybe not the poor but sort of kind of the the working masses this is emphasized by the fact that um, in a city that was depressed, like Beijing was during the 1920s, the capital had moved out, um, and just generally, uh, you know, there was trouble with, um, uh, you know, supply management because there were all these warlords going on at the same time, you know, like the Republican era had fallen apart. Um, uh, it was very depressed, so a lot of, uh, uh, policemen went into the academy, and there were actually... Um, I think like four times as many police officers per person as there were in any other city in the world during this time period. Now, they weren't uh, paid particularly well, and their training was about on par, but maybe like their resources for um, the job, if you will, uh, were not on par. Uh, but they just had huge uh, levels of police officers all over the city. Now, you would think that this would lead to a very sort of authoritarian state and in a way it did but um the police officers in their training were um told uh not so much to be uh merely enforcers of the law but sort of um create a social uh, uh peace if you will so if there was an argument that might not lead to an arrest let's say um in a modern state the police officers might stay out of the way uh, particularly if it's like between some business owner or something like that and a client where not necessarily they've stolen something, but there's some sort of just disagreement that isn't on a criminal level. Well, in Beijing, definitely the um, police officer would uh, come in there and try to state his opinion, and he would be the authority that would, that would be like the judge one way or the other. Um, you can see this with the rickshaw men with clients that refuse to pay, Etc. 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 Now the policemen didn't always rule on the sides of the uh, rickshaw drivers. Matter of fact, the police were known for being somewhat corrupt uh, in this area. Um, they would, you know, like uh, certainly look to a wealthier clientele uh, to maybe potentially like give a payoff or something like that um, in order to supplement their fairly meager income. Um, what else? Uh, Oh yeah, also the police officers were known to, uh, just because it was maybe not as authoritarian as implied, doesn't mean that there wasn't violence towards particular members of uh, the society. Matter of fact, the fact that there wasn't as much sort of top-down structure in terms of authoritarianism uh, meant that kind of on a local level, or on a, like a person-to-person -person level with a police officer and uh, whoever it was uh, else in society, there was also uh, often violence involved because there wasn't as strict of um, uh, social strata. Okay, so that's the police officers. I'm sure there's, there's a lot in here. This is a very, very dense book, so I'm sure I'm missing things. Um, you got the jeweler, the banker, and the restauranteur. Uh, this is essentially has to do, I mentioned unions, but there are a lot of guilds that uh, started in the city. I guess unionism was what developed later. But the guilds uh, kind of acted as early unions in the sense that um, unions act much more as sort of like uh, 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 correctors of wrong done by business owners. Whereas guilds, I think, are much more just sort of like collectives of certain talents that are there to advance their talent, if that makes sense. And often in kind of unseemly ways, but a lot of times just in terms of like, uh, further training or making sure, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, they, they can make some sort of collective decision that isn't necessarily uh, antagonistic against uh, a evil, quote unquote, boss or whatnot. Um, so there was this uh, guild association uh, that was sort of like the combined guild association. Uh, you know, you, each guild would have like their own members and then you'd have like the top member or the top of them. Uh, and there was the jeweler, the banker, and the restaurant tour. Um, I'm not going to remember who all this is, but I remember that the jeweler was the one that was sort of socially progressive. 
but then had some backlash against the conservative members of uh, the society. Uh, the banker was the one that was very much like, oh, it's the Chamber of Commerce. I think they were the head of the Chamber of Commerce, not the Guild Association, so I apologize. I just talked about uh, the Guild Association, but I believe that this might actually be the Chamber of Commerce. And I'm going to get to why the Chamber is important compared to the Guilds uh, in just a second, but I'm going to tell you about them first. Uh, the jeweler, the banker, and the restaurateur. So the jeweler was uh, sort of like the socially progressive uh, member of the Chamber of Commerce. He eventually got kicked out by the more conservative members uh, who kind of were like the top-down uh, uh, elites of the city. He eventually got kicked out by the restaurateur. The restaurateur uh, was sort of the uh, alliance, not of necessarily the progressives and not necessarily of the city elite, but sort of a lot of the small business owners that really did have power in the city. Specifically, the, the restaurant industry, you know, it's a lot then as it is now. Uh, there might be some big, like, corporate restaurants like McDonald's, I mean, nowadays. Um, but back, th but we also have a lot of, like, you know, a lot of people that just own mom-and-pop restaurants. Well, back then, that was the case uh, in the restaurant industry. And because of the sentimentality, I think, that a lot of the Chinese held for um, sort of... Uh, where they get their daily meal. You know, it's very much a kind of uh, sentimental thing within China. I feel like he really appealed to sort of a very strong uh, base in the city. Maybe, I mean, this is a very loose analogy, but maybe in the same way that the uh, iron rice bowl analogy uh, really appealed to a lot of peasants when Mao Zedong took power. Um, but anyway, this restaurateur eventually took power, and he was the one that controlled the Chamber of Commerce uh, throughout most of the 20s. Um, now, the reason that the Chamber of Commerce was so important, I mentioned that they were the city elites. Well, the city government was really, I'm not going to say non-functioning, but in combination of the semi-functioning city government and the fact that uh, the national government that would like have some interaction with the city in terms of like funds and all that stuff was pretty much a leech, uh, were controlled by various warlords during this time period. There were multiple um, semi-government agencies. We wouldn't consider them semi-government nowadays, but at that time period were semi-government. One of them, one of the most powerful of them, uh, along with the Guild Association, was the Chamber of Commerce. And uh, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, the police department, which again was a city agency, but kind of acted, I don't know, they, they just seemed more autonomous than sort of like a modern uh, city agency would be. They kind of carried out a lot of the functions of society. You know, think about soup kitchens. You think about, um, I believe it was the Chamber of Commerce that really pushed to get the uh, streetcar system, uh, which affected the rickshaw men, uh, very much put in place in China. Um, you know, the guilds, uh, kind of without a standardization of practices, of uh, correct uh, employment and business, kind of stood in that place to negotiate with their people against uh, you know, sort of, uh, well, you know, business can be sloppy sometimes that, uh, violation of whatever, I mean, there wasn't really an ideal of personal rights, but whatever sort of grievances, I guess you'd say, uh, that their members had against, uh, either clients or just whoever in the public, you could bring them to the guild. So they acted as sort of like that segment of what would now be standardized within like a, uh, you know, a government institution, if you will. Um, so yeah, that's kind of why the Chamber of Commerce was important and kind of who controlled that. Um, profits and people's, uh, livelihood, the politics of streetcar development. Well, essentially, as I mentioned, that Beijing was modernizing, um, but they were sort of kind of in this trap between the old world where you wouldn't move around at all and the new world, what eventually became, uh, maybe not the height of modernization which is now happening nowadays with cars, but really bicycles and um, uh, well, what was really the, what really overturned it was the uh, communist revolution. Uh, and that changed things in a whole nother way that really is not covered in this book at all. Uh, but they were moving towards uh, fits and starts towards modernization, but there were also large chunks that were left in the past. Well, one of the ways that was uh, fits and starts was transportation. I mentioned that the um, Beijing, uh, uh, rickshaw drivers were uh, kind of a modernization of the old uh, 
donkey cart drivers or paraquins or whatever those things are called. Well, the next step was the um, streetcar, the electrical streetcar. And this had both negative and positive consequences. Obviously, the rickshaw drivers were very mad because it was taking away their business. Um, but what ultimately wound up happening is that uh, it really didn't affect rickshaw drivers all that much. Well, why is this? Well, the streetcar was on a uh, set track, right? Um, so it could only uh, go around the limited parts of the city. There weren't parts that uh, were as quick as what the rickshaw drivers do. The rickshaw drivers could take you directly somewhere. You'd still have to walk a long distance on a large part of the uh, uh, tram track. Uh, pricing was also another issue. Um, now I'm, I'm trying to get, I'm trying to think about this correctly. I believe the rickshaw drivers were cheaper than what uh, the trams wound up being. And the problem was, was uh, even the rickshaw drivers were not appealing to the lowest base common den de denominator of the society um, because that was out of their price range. You know, they would spend like a month's wage to have a rickshaw driver. We're really talking about like the upper, maybe like third of society could uh, afford a rickshaw on a semi-regular basis. Now, the rickshaw drivers were worried that uh, the trolleys were going to take too much of their business. But what wound up happening is, um, I believe the trolleys uh, even priced themselves out of uh, being able to carry clients. So uh, they went to the rickshaw men. And also there was uh, sort of the environs of the um, uh, city streetcar. Now we think of that as modern, but honestly, in mod uh, think of like a like a subway system or you know the equivalent of like a trolley system or whatever as more uh, modern or more humanitarian than a rickshaw. But if you think about who rides the bus in modern society versus who rides. Um, say like uh, has their own private car or uh, hires like an Uber or something like that, uh, the bus is considered much lower. And that was true at this time period too. The upper third of the society, while being a rickshaw might not be the most modern, you could have it individually for yourselves. Whereas there were a lot of uh, pickpockets and there was also a lot of rumor of pickpockets. You know how that gets with the upper part of society. If there's some rumor of crime, uh, and there was, there was crime, but even the rumor of crime will make rich people just flee the scene like no tomorrow. Um, so they kind of went to the rickshaw drivers who, you know, had their own issues, but uh, at least you were dealing directly with them and you didn't have to deal with any other clientels or anything like that. Um, what else? Uh, let's see. Bosses, guilds, work gangs. I kind of talked about that a little bit. Um... Kind of the, what were the work gangs? Uh, I think those were eventually what wound up kind of starting some of the unionism movement. Um, it's kind of interesting, some of the different guilds, you know, things that no way would exist in modern society. Like they had the uh, night soil carriers, which were essentially the shit carriers that brought shit because there was not a uh, uh, modern, uh, you know, plumbing system. They would uh, essentially be a guild of people that would take your shit out of the city to uh, dry on the edge of the city. And then farmers would come and buy, them, buy essentially your shit to go work in their fields. Um, what else is there? Uh, citizens in the new public sphere. Oh, kind of uh, talked a lot about sort of about the politics uh, of uh, the era and specifically how... Um, you know, I mentioned that, uh, the city was very integrated between rich and poor. They would often live in the same Hoontog, which is kind of like a building complex. I mean, that's the closest analogy I could make. Uh, but what you could do, um, even if there wasn't this huge strata is that people were willing to come out and protest. So it was hard to sort of, it, the impression of the book is very much like you could get people out, but you couldn't formally get them to do one thing or the other. You could just kind of have these big public displays and then they might work or they might not work or they might push it the inch one way or the other. But um, it really took, uh, well, really a couple decades in order for that to really have a larger effect uh, on what would be like a modern unionist movement. And it should also be mentioned that, you know, the communists were only one sector of this movement. There was also the nationalists, 
who later in the, the 1920s uh, became much more kind of top-down affected in Beijing city politics. Uh, but they were also for uh, unionism, just not unionism to the point of like communism, if you will. That's like Shanghai Shek and stuff. Uh, they were considered more conservative, but um, they were definitely considered, well, uh, their, their, their goals might have been cynical, but um, they definitely co-opted uh, a lot of the unionist movement uh, in order to enrich their own political base. And I think there was some genuine care there, too. Um, city under siege. Uh, I mentioned the, the warlords uh, and just kind of a lot of the tributes that had to be paid off with that. Uh, the whole thing. Unionism and factionism. Uh, the machine breakers. That's kind of how the uh, book ends is it talks about in October 22nd, 1929 that there was a big um, uh, unionist riot you know, of all the, the looseness of the unions, the rickshaw drivers were the most loose. So it's kind of like this bubbling under the surface thing that eventually exploded when they were a bit able to kind of reach a critical mass or, you know, it's like, uh, well, yeah, it's a good example might be there are a number of unions that are, exist in the United States that are fairly well established, but like if the fast food workers union in the United States were to happen. And then suddenly they just have like a ton of power. And, you know, it's not necessarily all destruction. It might be for the good in the end, but the, the, if that power can be wielded at one time, you'll ha have quite a force. And if that force is not uh, necessarily peaceful, which the rickshaw drivers weren't, you know, a lot of them were themselves were individually poor and irritated and pissed off. Uh, you might lead to a riot that happened uh, uh, in, um, uh, you know, that happened. That happened in 1929. Now that should, uh, that said, the kind of uh, political complication between various rickshaw factions as well as boss governor thing is much more complicated than really I have time to review here, uh, but it's obviously covered within the book. Um, finally ends with uh, order and movement in city politics. Um, and I think it just kind of concludes where uh, the city went in terms of politics, et cetera, et cetera, uh, after the uh, kind of 1920s. So anyway, this book review has gone way long, but the Rickshaw Beijing, I got through it. I think I got most of my points. I'm really actually surprised. I think this is a pretty good review from a book that is very dense and very complicated, but very much worth your time if you want to know, if you're interested in what China looked like in an era that was very fascinating, but maybe a little less known than either the modern or ancient era. So, Rickshaw Beijing by David Strand. See you guys. Bye.